Hey, how you doing? It's been a little while since we've made one of these videos specifically, but you know, I've kind of missed them. So welcome back to Smackanori. So there are two things you're going to need to know before we get on to the actual story itself. The first is what we're going to read. Um, we're going to read from the Badminton Library book on fencing, boxing and wrestling. Now I've got two copies of these, of this book. Um, they're very, very different in binding, but the book inside is absolutely identical. Uh, this is this is one. This is the, a fairly standard binding of it, but this one is in absolutely stunning condition so i try not to use this at all it's a it's it, it's absolutely perfect there's a little bit of bumping to the to the binding but inside it's it's brilliant so this one tends to just sit on the side and, uh, and, and, and doesn't get used i do however have another which i picked up relatively cheaply because it's not in great condition the binding's a little bit battered and uh, the, it's uh, the spine's broken in a couple of places inside and it's a little bit uneven uh, but it's it's a great book, you know, it's still in perfectly good condition to read. This is the one we're going to read from tonight, but this one's a little bit interesting because it's a binding specifically made for uh, a library. And this book was part of the library catalogue for many years. So the first, uh, the first we've, we've got this little page at the beginning where every time the book was taken out, it was stamped with the date it had to be back. So it was taken out something like two to three weeks before that date. Um, so we've got a record of how many times this book was taken out from the library during the time it was there. And it was started off in 1930, the 9th of September 1930 is the first date that's stamped in this book. And the last date is the 9th of September 2008. So um, 78 years it was in the library, available to be borrowed, and during that time... It was borrowed 61 times, which I think is a surprisingly small number of times. But um, I don't know. What do you think? Is it, would you expect it to be more than that? I, when I looked at the dates and I counted up the amount of times it had been, been taken out of the library, I, I was really surprised. Less than once a year. Um, I mean, I guess we had both world wars during that time. So, you know. Maybe that put a bit of a damper on. The sort of person who might want to be reading about wrestling or fencing or boxing might not have been around. Um, but anyway, that's by the by, just an interesting little note. So this is effectively three different books con um, brought together. Um, it was created by His Grace the Duke of Beaufort, Knight of the Garter. Um, he edited it officially. I suspect he probably didn't because he was assisted by Alfred E. T. Watson, um, so I suspect that uh, Alfred Watson was the one that did most of the, the work, and His Grace, the Duke of Beaufort, was the man who simply um, made it happen and put his name to it. Um, so we've got three books. We've got one on fencing, we've got one on boxing, and one on wrestling, and they're combined together. Now, the Babington Library has large numbers of these books covering every different sport you can think of cricket football angling um they're, they're all they've all got their own one and i've i i would love to maybe one day own a complete set of the badminton library but that's going to be a while so we're going to read from the book on wrestling uh, but before we get that let me tell you a little bit about the other books there's a book on on uh, fencing at, at the start which, as you would expect based on when this was published, which was 1889, it's not really what we recognise as modern sport fencing today. It's much more akin to classical fencing. Um, the names might be familiar to those of you that are interested in the history of, of, of fencing. Walter Pollock, F.C. Grove and Camille Prevost. Um, the three of them were written with a complete bio... Were written. The three of them wrote the book with a complete biography of the art by Edgerton Castle. Uh, another very famous name if you're involved in any uh, historical fencing or recreation or anything like that. Um, we've got a book on boxing by E.B. Mitchell, another very, very common name. If you've read boxing histories, you'll probably come across E.B. Mitchell. But the wrestling is where it starts to get interesting because the book on wrestling is our dear friend, Walter Armstrong. And as you might expect with, uh, with Walter, it focuses heavily on Cumberland and Westmoreland, but we're not going to look at that because there's a chapter towards the end entitled Ring Reminiscences, and that's what we're going to read today. But before we do, there's one more thing you need to know, and that is what we're drinking this evening. 
what we're drinking this evening is a, a lovely 10-year-old Speyside malt. It's just delightful. Uh, it was on offer when I happened to be doing the, the shopping. I was down at the supermarket doing, doing a bit of an emergency shop. We've got four kids at home, so I spend a lot of time being sent to the supermarket to buy things. And I just happened to accidentally buy a bottle of whiskey while I was at it. And I'm really glad I did. This is a lovely one. <sighs> Can't beat it. Anyway, let's get on with the reading now, because we must have been talking for quite some time, and I haven't actually read you anything yet, so I can only apologise for that. He probably used to. How many times do you think I'm going to put these glasses on and off my face? Stick something in the comments. Have a guess. Um, we'll count them up, and whoever gets closest will um, will pin the comment. Um, I suspect hundreds, by the way I normally go. But anyway, let's get get to the book now. I, I promise not to, to waffle too much. Um, clearly, that isn't going to happen. I'm going to waffle all the time. Tangents are my thing. I don't even really notice that. Did you see what I did there? Anyway, here we go. Ring reminiscences. Those who have never competed in a wrestling ring will probably be unable to understand the feelings of two friends when they happen to be pitted together in the magic circle, especially if the friends should meet in the first round before the chill is off their nerves. Anyone who imagines either man can do his best under the circumstances had better try the experiment, and he will be immediately undeceived. With a stranger, the case is quite altered. There's far less hesitation in lugging him about and getting the very best obtainable hold. Indeed, many a contest is lost by a careless and indifferent grip to begin with, and through being too cocksure. That it requires a certain amount of pluck to wrestle successfully in a public ring, surrounded by thousands of spectators, is an obvious fact. And dyke backens who could fell out at home have on most occasions been eager to patronise the purchase system when confronted by an antagonist in the arena. Frequently a first-class hinterdiker. I don't know what that means. I feel like I should, but I don't has been known to fall before the clutch of a third-class man in a competition when fair felling was the order of the day. If the stomach, as a clever, a certain clever writer has asserted, is the seat of funk, it is somewhat astonishing that Cumberland and Westmoreland wrestlers, who are amongst the foremost trenchermen in the known world, should suffer from this fearful malady. Without doubt, wrestling is the most popular athletic exercise in the classic borderland, and the great annual meetings at Carlisle and Grasmere are productive of some of the unparalleled excitement of the northern counties. Among all the numerous gatherings of a similar kind during the season, those two rings are looked upon as the spots where immortality is achieved, and where the best men in the country assemble once a year, animated with the burning and overwhelming desire of stamping their names on an undying page of history. He makes it sound really quite something, doesn't he? You know, I do wonder if he's kind of hamming it up for the book, or whether it really was that, that awesome. Just, sorry, anyway, where were we? Yes. The man who has not a hobby of some kind must be a poor creature indeed. And as the old farmer remarked when his better half was heckling him for attending a main in company with Professor Wilson, Out oh, lass, out the gob. The very yen is his hobby, and cockfighting's mine. I, yeah. Interesting. Forgive me for the accent. You know, I am a northerner originally, but not from Cumberland and Westmoreland. If you're familiar with northern English accents, uh, yeah, Yorkshire is my original home. Uh, the grand old professor was passionately fond of this same cockfighting, but then was equally enthusiastic in regard to wrestling, boxing and other athletic sports. And in the December number of Blackwood, 1823, thus delivers himself on the subject of wrestling. It is impossible to conceive the intense interest taken by the whole northern population in this most rural and muscular amusement. For weeks before the Carlisle Great Annual Contest, nothing else is talked of on road, field, flood, foot or horseback. We fear it is thought of even in church, which we regret and condemn, and in every little comfortable public within thirty miles diameter, the home brood quivers in the glasses and the oaken tables to knuckles, smiting the board in corroboration of a Graham, a Cass, a Lochlan, 
a solid yeet, a Welson, or a Whiteman, names well known in the wrestling world at that period. A political friend of ours, a staunch fellow, in passing through the lakes last autumn, heard of nothing but the contest for the county, which he understood would lie between Lord Lowther, the sitting member, and Lord Bruffham. But to his sore perplexity, he heard the names of the new candidates, to him, hitherto unknown. And on meeting us, at the best of inns, the White Lion Boness, he told us, with a downcast and serious countenance, that Lord Lowther would be ousted, for that the struggle, as far as he could learn, would ultimately be between Thomas Ford of Egremont and William Richardson of Coldbeck, two celebrated wrestlers, men of no landed property and probably radicals. It's not easy, even for the most poetical and picturesque imagination, to create for itself a more beautiful sight than the ring at Carlisle. Fifteen thousand people, perhaps, are there, all gazing anxiously on the candidates for the county. Down goes Cass, Waitman is the standing member, and the agitation of a thousand passions, a suppressed shudder, and an undergrowl move the mighty multitude like an earthquake. No savage anger, no boiling rage of ruined blacklegs, no searing of mercenary swells, but the visible and audible movements of calm, strong, temperate English hearts, free from all fear and ferocity, and swayed for a few moments of sublime pathos, by the power of nature working in victory or defeat. Professor Wilson gave it as his opinion that the greatest number of powerful men he ever saw was in the wrestling ring at Carlisle, and in the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, A.D. 1823. Some years prior to the above date, Wilson, who was promoting the sport at Ambleside, wrote a very amusing account of the wrestling held there. The genial professor goes on to say, On Thursday I went to Ambleside with Williams and George Fleming to see the wrestling. It was very good. A man from Cumberland, with a white hat and brown shirt, threatened to fling everybody and fight them afterwards. The fighting I put a stop to. He stood till the last, but was thrown by a schoolmaster of the name of Robinson, cousin of the imp who used to be at Ellery, who won the belt with a handsome inscription from Professor Wilson. We had then a number of single matches, the best of three throws, and Collinson of Bowness threw Robinson easily he himself having been previously thrown by the Cumbrian for the belt. One donkey, who had been thrown for the belt, then threw Collinson, and a tailor called Holmes threw Cumberland, a little fellow about the size of Blair, the professor's son, threw a man of six feet high and fell upon him with all his weight. Holmes, the tailor, then threw Roford Long. The wrestling on the whole gave the family great delight. Ritson, a Cumberland worthy who had once been a famous wrestler in his youth, tells how he once wrestled with Kit North and threw him twice out of three falls, but he owned the professor was a very bad intellect. Wilson beat him at jumping. He could jump twelve yards in three jumps with a great stone in each hand. Ritson could only manage eleven and three quarters. First time at Professor Wilson come to Wasselton Hyde, said Ritson. He set a tent up in field and he gat it wheel with stock bread with bread and beef and cheese and rum and ale. Then he gitted up my grandfather and Thomas Tyson, Isaac Fletcher and Dwozip Stabble and had Robert Grieve and some mower. Then they were rustling for buckskin breeks, gurning for backer through horse collar and now it was sad that Professor would rustle to champion at conclusion at sports. There was a gay deed among them, as you may be sure. It was as life mirth among us as long as Professor Wilson was at Westland Hyde. The late Mr. Richard Margotson, who was many years chairman and secretary of the Cumberland and Westmoreland Wrestling Society in London, had the pleasure of shaking hands with Christopher North after one of his successes at Windermere, the professor declaring Margotson to be the best wrestler in England. Mr. Margotson had the distinguished honour of winning 30 belts in Westmoreland before attaining his majority. And that's where we're going to stop it now. We've got a few... I mean, I, like all of these books, there's something about the language that they use which I find hugely evocative, and I, I apologise for my, my mangling of the, the northern dialect that I don't speak, so I'm just trying to find somewhere to put my glasses. Let's just throw them over there. I just... I love them. 
I absolutely love them. I love these old books. And whatever you think about Walter Armstrong, he could certainly string a few words together in a, in a nice way. So I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. If you have, do like and, and share this video. Stick something in the comments. Let me know if you want me to carry on and read more of what old um, Cross Buttercup has to say. Then um, I'd be very happy to. I'm going to finish my, uh, my whiskey. So, for those of you still here at the very end of the video, fight team.